Hi guys, hope everyone's having a great Sunday evening. Got a couple quick announcements and we'll dive right into the questions. First and foremost, I don't know if you can see it, but tomorrow's video is on Peter Schiff and his most recent book where he talks about the bankruptcy of the United States. I think it's called the Bankrupt America. So we're gonna do a video just like the Ray Dalio video. We're gonna break through the first chapter of that book and kind of go over it step by step. That's uh, first and foremost, I'm super stoked about that. Uh, number two is over on this side. Uh, Sebastian got things set up so we can take super chats on the live stream. So if you guys want to support the channel, you can go ahead and do the, the super chat deal. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but uh, uh, anything, or if you guys have any questions in the comments, let me know and I'll go ahead and ask Sebastian. He'll figure out how it works. But uh, if you want to support the channel, you can do that through super chats. Let me go ahead and dive in here. I know the first question we had was what would make interest rates go up? And it's really the confidence that the investors have that they're going to be paid back what they gave the, the what they gave the, the government. So what they lent the government. So meaning what they get paid back as far as its purchasing power. So if they feel as though there's a risk of them not getting their purchasing power back, then that's going to make interest rates go up. Uh, and I also want to remind everyone too that uh, you know I've had a lot of comments in the last few days of people saying, well, if we go into a recession or if the you know the housing bubble tanks or something like that, that the Fed's going to come in and they're, they're going to lower rates and you know it's going to be a repeat of uh, 2010 through through now with zero uh, percent interest rates. And that's very well possible. But I don't think people uh, remember that in the 1970s, we had a recession and almost a depression, but it was an inflationary recession. And that's just as possible as a deflationary recession. So I just want everyone to kind of keep that in mind. Okay, let's see. Oh, shit, we don't. Whoops. Do we have the audio set up? <laughs> I don't know. Can you guys hear me? I just forgot. We forgot to set up the audio. If you guys can hear me, can you put in the, the chat? Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> uh, I totally forgot we we didn't have the mic. Okay, no big deal, Sebastian. They they said they could hear it. All right. So next question here. Um, stop working. Is the stock market a safe investment long term? I, I, <laughs> I think he's being sarcastic there. If you're not, I would say no because the the CAPE ratio is almost 30. And so your expected returns on that are not very good. And you always want to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. And there's nothing cheap about the market right now, that's for sure. Okay, just... Okay, let's see. Is there a safer currency to, okay, so stay curious, says, is there a safer currency to invest instead of the dollar? Gold, and that, that's, that's it. I mean, it's liquid, uh, you've got some downside risk there, so I wouldn't uh, you know, go all in on that, but if you got 10% of your uh, portfolio in gold, you know that it's gonna retain a certain level of purchasing power so if the market does collapse and go down by 50%, you've got liquidity there that you can come in and buy assets when they're cheap, but also if we get inflation, you're not gonna lose a lot of the purchasing power of your dollars, or if you have like short-term treasuries, um, that could be uh, an option as well. If you, if you wanna keep liquidity, I wouldn't do you know anything longer than a year, but maybe do, I don't know, three months treasuries and just keep rolling them over. Uh, just so you've got that liquidity, that might be an option as well. It just really depends on how worried you are about inflation. But in three to six months a year, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay, is there a safe currency? Okay. So if you guys have any specific questions, I see, you guys are going back and forth in the chat, which is fantastic. It's great to 
to build that community. But uh, maybe just start your comment with the word question and then colon so I know, so I can get to them a lot faster. If you guys could do that for me, that would be really great. Okay, so, okay, here's one. So, well, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Niku, Niku Soren says, hello, George, can Fed buy stocks into infinity? It, well, I mean, technically they can't, but they can always just change the rules and I, I don't see why they won't. It definitely happened in Japan. They own a lot of the ETFs. And in fact, they might even own a, a majority of the ETFs in Japan. So. They definitely can do it. It's just the, the fiddler is going to be inflation. It's just people, it's out of sight, out of mind because it hasn't happened in the United States for so long. But you've got to think back to the 1970s or the 1980s. And if someone suggested that, well, they can just print up money to buy stocks, people would go bananas because they had just experienced a, a big decade of inflation. That's what was most recent in their mind. So the, the Fed can only do so much. At a certain point, they, they cannot print anymore because inflation is going to call their bluff. Okay. Okay. And now, Amar says, what are your thoughts on the Fed tokenizing the USD decentralized platform? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the US government going to a digital currency. I think it's inevitable, if that's what your question is. It just gives them too much control. And I'm gonna come out with a, a video on this, but I mean, the Reader's Digest version is if they can track every single dollar. Right now the Fed can create dollars and then they throw them out into the system, but they don't know exactly where those dollars are actually going. If they could control where those dollars are going, because maybe each dollar has a, a serial number that would get tracked every single time there was a different transaction, then the government could, I mean, basically they could compartmentalize your bank account and they could limit your, your spending to certain things. So if they wanted to promote, let's say, electronic vehicles, they could limit you to buying, um, you know, only one uh, gas car and then the other one would have to be an electronic vehicle uh, electric vehicle uh, or another thing like uh, let's say someone had got a DUI uh, well they could just keep you from buying alcohol they just those those they could make it so any of that digital currency that you had could not go to the purchase of alcohol and if, and if, it's, if we're cashless then how, how do you do it how, how do you wiggle your way around that so it's just an Orwellian, uh, just a really, it's crazy how, um, you know, 1984, that book, it just plays out in so many different ways. But um, I definitely think that, that that's where we're going. Now, do we get there in five years, 10 years? I don't know. But eventually, I think we're, we're getting there. Okay. That's okay. We got that. Okay. Alexander. Uh, Shekaro asks, when do you think the technical recession will begin based off the fact that the initial jobless claims are already picking up and the GDP leading in indicator looks horrible? Well, I, I mean, you, you can't time these things because it's all about probabilities. It's it's not about certainties. It's just like the weather. I always use that as an example. I think the probabilities are increasing that we get that recession in 2020, especially after the election, because, you know, Trump will do everything he can to juice the market before then. And so it looks like we're not in a recession. But um, I, I think that the probabilities are getting greater and greater that uh, we go into recession, you know, 2020 or first part of uh, 2021. And it, it's not a crazy claim because we're in the longest expansion in U.S. history without a recession. I mean, you just pull up a chart on it. And uh, so, 
you know, are we, the other argument has to be, well, we're just never going to have another recession. And I think no one would argue that. So if we're going to have another recession, we've, we're already long in the tooth, way long in the tooth by a couple of years. So we got to be closer to it than further from it. Yeah, and then Phantom Wolf says in the past he thinks recession is 2020. I think there's a good probability, but I, I wouldn't say, you know, bet on it and short the S&P right now that there's there's no way you want to do that. And not only that, but we can have an inflationary recession where the S&P would actually go up. So if you're short it, then, then you really got problems. Okay, Anthony asks, how's Medellin with the protests? You don't even notice it. I think we just had like a day of it. And it's, the, 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 I think the US media makes quite a bit bigger deal of that than it really is. But, uh, but it, it's, you, you gotta, on a bigger picture, it's a big deal because you're seeing a lot of this social unrest throughout the entire world. So I think Medellin is, is, is feeling that, that's a symptom. And you gotta put all the pieces of the puzzle together and realize that all of this money printing and all these artificially low interest rates that have boosted asset prices for the last 10 years and has really only gone to the top maybe 5%, I mean, people see that. And although their standard of living might not have gone down too much, uh, they're pissed. And if inflation has raised, at, has gone up at the rate that, that uh, shadow stats, says it has, if you're measuring it the same way that they did in the 70s or the 80s, then real wages have actually gone down quite a bit. So that would make a lot of sense if real wages have gone down, but then the stock market's going up. So all these people with assets, you know, they get out there on Instagram and say how rich they are because their house has doubled in price. And that's going to piss off a lot of people that don't own assets. Yeah, so uh, cheapless... Um, sheepless in Georgia says what could cause spike in interest rates. Yeah. So again, going back to just investor confidence that they're going to get paid back the same amount or the same amount of purchasing power that they lent the government. Okay. Let's see here. So, Okay, <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, it's, first of all, Tommy, I, I don't know what your real name is, but I really appreciate all the help. You, you really, you know, go back and forth in the comments a lot. Really sincerely appreciate you putting the, uh, investing your time in this. Says, how does it feel to be fit? Yeah, I wouldn't go that far, buddy. <laughs> I, like my dad says, I, I'm a legend in my own mind, and, and that's about it, so. I mean, Schiff and Dent, those guys have been doing this a long time. Uh, i got a lot of respect for those guys, especially Schiff. So I, I wouldn't put myself in that category. But to be mentioned in that is, um, you know, it, it's amazing. So I appreciate it. Is that the yes. one getting to that? Okay. This is a okay, so let's see. Progressive investing what would you recommend one allocate to physical precious precious metals insurance of five to ten percent because i like cash flowing stuff i like stuff that pays you to own it and unfortunately gold doesn't now i think sprott and i, I got to research this guys so, so don't only to it but i think sprott might have some um investment vehicles where you can have exposure to gold and get a dividend yield i'm not sure but that's something that I would be very interested in, especially if Rick Rule is a part of it. I'm a huge, huge fan of Rick Rule. So that may be one way, but that's going to be more speculative. But uh, that's what I say. If you're looking at it just as insurance, then 5 to 10%. Do you think? Okay, Alexander, do you think markets, do you think that the markets have started to peak because it's starting to seem more volatile? See, again, peak, peak how? In nominal terms or real terms? I mean, in nominal terms, they could go to the moon, just like Venezuela did. But uh, in, in real terms, you got to look at the CAPE ratio. 
And the CAPE ratio, if you're at 30 on the CAPE ratio, the next 10 years, 20 years, it does not look good for your expected returns. So I just think it's an expensive market and I'm not gonna buy anything that's expensive, but it doesn't mean that it could go down in nominal terms because they could just print to infinity. Like the other person said, they could buy the market and, and then it's going up, but it's only going up in nominal terms. Okay. Uh, Jesse asks, how many years can the Fed extend and pretend with the central banks? It seems like they can lie about the numbers and people like, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, look at how long Japan's done it and, and got away with it. Although their, their circumstances are much different because they're the largest creditor nation in the world. So they've got a lot of internal savings where they can, they can buy up all that garbage debt. So it's a much different situation there. And their velocity is a lot lower naturally because of their demographic situation. But um, I mean, who knows? I, it's just, you know, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So it, it's just, I can't say for certain, but I can say that the probabilities are that we're getting closer to that line in the sand where they just can't, they can't fake it anymore because you know they're they're out of ammo, and sooner or later the people are going to have to start realizing that they're just monetizing the debt. So I, I think that'll come sooner than later. Okay. Will the Fed lower rates on December eleventh? Boy, that's that's a great question. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I. I that's a great question. I'm going to take a pass on that one just because I haven't studied it enough. I don't know what the odds are right now. And I haven't heard a lot about it on a lot of the resources that I use, which is uh, Macro Voices, the podcast. If you guys aren't listening to that right now, definitely do so. And Real Vision. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if, if they did or they didn't. I, I guess that's my best answer. So is there going to be a recession or not? Too many videos, YouTube. Okay, I'm not sure about that one. Thought, <laughs> Mario Gutierrez, thoughts on the cyber truck. Come on. I, I don't want to be too hard on Tesla because the cars are really cool. I mean, they're, they're totally cool. But I think that was just a, it's, it's just a show. It's just a show. And they're taking all these deposits on the, on the roadster and the semi truck and all these things. I mean, would you give your money to Elon Musk or Tesla uh, interest free for an indefinite? I mean, who knows? Three, four, five years. I don't. I don't think that's wise. If you're going to buy a Tesla, I think they're great cars. But just lease one. Don't don't buy one and don't get, put a, a deposit down that you may never get back. Okay. Is there going to be? Baxter, yeah, but when I get to that, okay. So Sebastian's telling me we got a live chat from back or um, a uh, super chat, super chat. That's what it is from Baxter. So first and foremost, thanks a lot, Baxter. I, I really appreciate that. All the cost for the editing and stuff, I just do it out of pocket, just because I love producing the videos, and you guys are hopefully getting a lot of uh, value out of it. But I, I really appreciate that. So you're. Question is, what is your investment tip for 2020? My investment tip for any year, it, it never changes. And that's to buy what's cheap, sell it if it's expensive, make sure that you're getting paid to own things, and then diversify your entire portfolio, have insurance with precious metals, and then diversify your currency risk and your political risk. So in the United States right now, I think the only thing that's cheap is 30 year fixed rate debt. So if you can somehow use 30 year fixed rate debt to buy an asset that isn't overpriced, and what do I mean by that? So let's say a rental property in Kansas City that you can still buy under the cost of construction. That's what I'm talking about. And also if you look at certain markets, very few, but certain markets in the Midwest, the um, price to income ratio isn't as exaggerated 
is it as it is in the majority of the United States. So, you know, it, it's, it's much more reasonable. So I don't think it's cheap, the asset itself, but I think it's a good way to express that bet to have something in your portfolio that is super cheap. And that's that 30 year fixed rate that debt. So uh, in 2020, uh, I'd say 30 year fixed rate debt, if you can do it on an asset that's got great cash flow that you can buy it at a reasonable price under the cost of construction in a good neighborhood, uh, make sure you've got some uh, insurance there with precious metals. And um, if you're in the market, if you're one of those people, then I'd suggest uh, make sure you got longs and shorts just to hedge your bets. Okay, so what is this? The same super chat. That's the same super chat. Oh, do I different agree? ones? Well, what's the next question now? Okay, so I got a, an, another super chat here from Baruch uh, Spinoza. I really appreciate that, Bar uh, Baruch. Thank you very much. And he or she asks, uh, do you see Canada hitting a bad recession? It's the housing market. I mean, it's just bonkers there. I, I, I haven't done as much research uh, to give you a, a really, really good opinion. But I think the entire, not the entire economy, but a good part of the economy there is, is based on the appreciation of the housing market. And once that ends or goes the opposite direction, you know, all that demand that has been artificially created by the, that asset bubble is going to deflate and you're going to have some real problems. So I, I think the, the catalyst there is the housing market which is different from the United States because the United States, I don't think the housing market is the catalyst. Uh, I, I don't see it taking us into the next recession. Um, I think the, the next recession is going to deflate the housing market. So it, it's the opposite of 2009, but in the, in Canada, I, I do think it's going to, you're going to feel some pain. I don't think it's a, as bad as the U S because I don't think you guys have the exposure to the derivatives and, it, there's a lot less uh, systemic risk there, but if it goes down, it's it, you're definitely going to feel it. And it, and it, and it can't go up forever. I mean, it's just getting bonkers there. Just like Australia, New Zealand is the same. And a lot of the European countries that have negative interest rates. Okay. So back to, let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry guys. I mean, I lost my place there. Let me go back here. Okay, so now, oh, there's Baxter. Okay, now I see that super chat. Okay, so shoot. Sorry, guys, I, I lost my place, so I'm going to skip to the next one that I see, and that's uh, Yankton Heating and Cooling. Uh, question, your thoughts on silver as an investment versus gold? Well, I know that ratio between silver and gold is skewed, but silver is going to have – a little more potential downside if the if the market are we going to a recession because it's more of an industrial. I don't know a lot about it, um, but I don't know that I'd go into silver. I I'd go into silver more as an appreciation play, more of a speculative play, and I'd go into gold more as a, an insurance play. Okay, let's see next one. Okay, so we got that. Okay, so <laughs> that's the same question a few times here. Okay, uh, question from Farmers Dude. Hey, when is the dollar going to drop? <laughs> I don't know, because there, there's really good arguments for deflation and the dollar increasing. I've got to do a video on what Jeff Snyder calls the dollar short squeeze, and that's because there's so much debt outside of the United States that's denominated in dollars that needs to roll over, that, that you could get excessive demand for the dollar. So even though the Fed's printing, the dollar still could rise because of all this debt that was taken on in these foreign countries when the United States interest rates were so low. Because a foreign country, whether it's a corporation or the country themselves, it, you know, when the um, 
when the interest rates are, you know, zero, they can come in and borrow in dollars and pay a lot less on that debt as far as an interest rate because the investors feel as though they don't have the same type of currency risk as they would maybe if they're lending them or, or if they're uh, going to be paid back in um, you know, Colombian pesos, let's say. So that country or corporation can get that debt at a lower interest rate. So you have all these countries piling in when the Fed lowers rates. So you have all this outstanding debt that creates demand for the dollar outside of the United States. So now that said, once the dollar goes up to a certain level, then the, the U.S. is the biggest debtor nation in the whole wide world ever. So as you guys know, the dollar increasing uh, would be a real burden on any uh, debtors in the United States. The in the U.S. being the largest debtor, then that would really affect them. So they would have to come in with something to to stop that and prevent that. So I think that's what would happen if the dollar goes up to let's say maybe um, uh, 105, something like that, on the DXY. Uh, the, I, don't, I just don't think the U.S. government could take the pain, nor could the, the, the U.S. consumer. Okay, so um, let's see, I lost my place in here. Okay, oh, here's another. So Mark Martin asks, would you say the greatest invention of all time is the U.S. dollar? <laughs> if, boy. I mean, I think you're being sarcastic there. It's definitely the cleverest, other than maybe the Federal Reserve, to enrich banks. It's, it's I mean, it's pretty devious, the, the way that they... Or maybe the petrodollar, I might say, would be an even better invention. That that was just the U.S. limitless credit card right there that has just improved the standard of living and, and allowed Americans to live beyond their means for, for decades. Now, sooner or later, that will come to an end. But in the interim, it allows Americans to uh, produce a lot less than they would have to and live really high on the hog. Can you question your thoughts? Okay, he keeps asking that. What's the best, okay, so Grant asked, what's the best way to protect yourself from civil unrest? It's you gotta diversify your political risk. So have a bank account outside the United States, try to get residency outside of the United States. Um, it, it, you know, a lot of people aren't as flexible with their schedule as I am. If you are, try to get a passport, dual citizenship. Anything that you can do like that is like the guys over at Sovereign Man say, you know, what's your downside on that? It's it, You've only got upsides. So anything you can do to diversify your political risk, even if it's just having a bank account outside the United States, I, I think is a, a great idea. And if you could get a residency so you wouldn't have to worry about uh, the visa, if you decide that, hey, you know what, I'm going to check out of the U.S. for a few months here, that's going to be beneficial. Okay, Chris asks, Chris, Chris Wright asks a question, what do you think of the likelihood of financial depression? You've really got to define what you mean by a financial depression because, I mean, are you talking about a debt deleveraging or are you talking about uh, a deflationary depression? As far as a debt deleveraging, I think that's it's got to happen sooner or later because you know we've got the business cycle and the Fed keeps trying to paper over the business cycle, but sooner or later that's that's not going to pan out. Okay, question of uh, Brent or Brett, excuse me, Nelson asks, can you explain whether the whether the world is interconnected? Venezuela collapsed and had to affect the rest of the world. Would any individual country bring down the world? Uh, the U.S., China. I mean, when you're getting into economies like that, then that's going to affect the rest of the world. Now, is it going to, you know, mean utter ruin? I, I don't think so. But 
a country like Venezuela, you know, if they have a collapse, you're just going to have a lot of oil probably offline. So that might drive up the price of oil a little bit. But I don't see Venezuela really having a big effect. It's just like Greece or Cyprus. It, it just they're 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 too insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Um, not that the suffering there is insignificant, but I'm just talking about their contribution to the global economy. Okay. Okay, who's asking the same question? Uh, oh, Cryptopolis asks, question, if you lost everything you have today, how would you make it all back? That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. What would I do? You have to learn to be an expert at something. So I would, because if, if you're an expert at something, you've got a few different ways to leverage that. Number one, you can, if you're really, really good at something, let, let me give you a quick example to answer that question. When, when I was, uh, you know, back when I was an entrepreneur, I, um, I, I was making good money, but I, I wasn't making ridiculous money like I did a little bit later on. And um, I, I went into a little small business that was in California and uh, I went and I was hired as a consultant to go in and take it over from bankruptcy and, uh, you know, get it back on its feet and sell it. Now, you know, it wasn't a huge business. It was uh, at the time we uh, took it over, it wasn't doing much revenue, but I, I got it up to where it was doing maybe, um, I can't remember, maybe uh, 100, 150,000 a month in revenue. Something like that. I can't remember exactly. But uh, anyway, so then after about two years of it getting profitable, we're going to go ahead and flip it. The guy that I was consulting for, he wanted to flip it. So we said, great. So we went ahead and flipped it. And we flipped it for, I can't remember what it sold for, maybe, uh, you know, 500 grand, something like that. And then uh, the guy that came in and bought it said, listen, I'm only going to buy it if this George guy stays on because I think he's instrumental. So uh, I stayed on and then about two years later, uh, you know, I was able to figure a few things out and we had some more resources at our disposal. So we got that company up to doing about a million a month in, uh, in revenue. And then that guy was able to flip it about a year later for 2 million. So he made a huge profit. So my point is I, I, I became an expert in that field and then after that, he, the, the gentleman that flipped it and I made him a lot of money, he said, listen, what are you doing now? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll just start something on my own, kind of similar. And he's like, okay, how much money do you need? And I said, well, I, probably 400 grand. He said, okay, done. So, it, so he was just an immediate investor. And that's how I got part of the seed capital, that and some money that I'd saved up to start the next business, which was uh, extremely successful. So my point there is that, you know, it, it's people think it's, it's luck and yeah, it is to a certain extent, but if you're good enough at, at X, Y, Z thing, people are going to notice that. And if you can make them return, they're going to be throwing money at you. It's just, it's, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, and then I would take that a step further. And if you've got expertise nowadays with, with online, I mean, this YouTube channel is a great example of that. I started this YouTube channel, I mean, maybe three, maybe four months ago, something like that. And it's just, it's just blown up and it's, um, and it is, I've never taken an economics class in my life. I've never taken a finance course. None of that. I just obsess, uh, you know, with podcasts and audiobooks, And I just, I just can't get enough of, of this, this macro stuff and trying to figure things out. So, um, you know, you know, maybe you can write a blog or, I mean, there's just so many ways to monetize online nowadays. If you've got, uh, expertise in a certain area. So education, make yourself an expert in a certain area. And then I would take the proceeds from that and I would parlay that into real estate. And then I'd take that and, and flip houses. So I'd get enough money to where I could start taking hard money out, which would be if I saved maybe 20, 30 grand and I'd start flipping houses with hard money. In addition to bringing in that cash flow from whatever I set up as being an expert uh, in the first place.
Okay. Okay, Nick has a super chat. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. It's awesome. Uh, will deflation happen first or inflation? That's that's the question. And there's such a good argument for both. Uh, it, and, and, you know, people say what's going to happen, deflation or inflation. There's a very good chance that both. There's a really high probability that we go into deflation. And as a result of us going into deflation, the Fed prints so much money or they do MMT to kind of get around the need for credit having to be in the system to increase that velocity, that that's what brings on the inflation or, or even potentially hyperinflation if all those dollars from outside the United States come pouring back in. So I, I think that it, there's a good chance that, that you see both. Okay. And is this? It's not a question, but. Oh, just thank you. Okay. So back, and that's Baxter? That's the. No, no, no. That's the, the currency. That's what. Glennis. Oh, Glennis. Uh, sent a super chat. I really appreciate that, Glennis. Really, really awesome. Helps support the channel. He says, thanks for your uh, time and knowledge. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay, let's go back. Um, okay, interconnected. We got that one. Elton Gold Silver got that. If you lost everything. That was a great question. China phase three. Oh, Simon asked, will the China first phase trade deal make any difference? I think it's all window dressing. I think it's all smoke and mirrors. I, 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 I haven't studied a lot into it because it's kind of getting more into the minutia. But um, I, I think I think they're just using it as a way to manipulate markets, quite frankly. But but that's just but I have no evidence to, to prove that. That's just my opinion. Oh yeah, so Peter has a great question here. Peter uh, Maganow, if I'm pronouncing that right. A question, your thoughts on a third of the car sales having negative equity. <laughs> it's just, I mean, think about what they've done to try to create more demand in our market. They just, I mean, it's so obvious. They, they, they pump up a bubble in the 90s, and, and this is exactly what Schiff talks about in his book, and I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow in the video, and, and Peter just hits the nail on the head with this. They start to print all this money, inject all this liquidity. Uh, I even looked at the money supply in the 90s. Boom, it's going up. It almost, I think it doubled in the 90s. So all that's going in to inflate this bubble that we have in, in the uh, stock market, dot com. So that deflates. So they didn't want to go through that pain. It's just like the business cycle that the example I used in the video the other day with uh, with the inverted yield curve. You know, the, the, the recession is the cure. That's it drops prices down. So that's what increases demand or those prices coming down. If you don't let those prices come down, you never experience that cure. The only thing that happens is the malinvestment increases. So. You have this bubble in the dot com, you have that bus. So then Greenspan comes and drops rates. Let's get them down. Let's create another bubble to artificially stimulate the economy so we don't have to deal with any pain. Then that goes into the housing market. And that's when it blows up there. And, and now they're just, in the last 10 years, it's all gone into government debt. They, they, now that's the, the bubble. So and at a certain point, they just can't juice demand anymore. Okay, so now what do you do? Oh, I know. So the consumer's income isn't increasing. What do we do to juice car sales? Oh, we'll, ju we'll just ex not only drop interest rates down to almost zero, but we'll just extend out the term on their loan just to infinity and beyond. So sure, if you can, now you can buy, anyone can afford a $100,000 car, right? <laughs> Obviously, I'm exaggerating. But if you take out that term to 20 years and, and drop the interest down to zero, Okay, well, I can afford a Ferrari now, but but as you guys know, a car is a depreciating asset, substantial depreciating asset. So you just have all that upside down. So what happens when they have to sell those cars? You know, do they have to eat the difference? It's just it's a disaster waiting to happen, and so is the student loan debt because 
the student loan debt, you cannot get it off your, your balance sheet if you go through bankruptcy. You're, you're just, you're completely screwed. So you've got this situation where the consumer has all this student loan debt and they have all this auto debt how is that going to juice spending in the next recession? They're tapped out. They're completely tapped out. And then you've got uh, you know Santander, who's heavy duty into these subprime auto loans, and 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 of course they they you know um, bundle them into these asset backed securities. So who knows who the, who's buying those and then levering up a thousand times and all the uh, systemic risk that could be involved there in a recession. You know, we didn't see any of that play out with the mortgage-backed securities until, you know what, hit the fan. So I don't think that's as big of a market as the mortgage-backed securities were, but you could see some type of systemic risk like that. Um, let's see, question. Okay. Uh, Jesse, another uh, uh, super chat. Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate it. He says, enjoy a beer or something. <laughs> Thanks for your great content. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Really appreciate the support for the channel. What's the best way to protect a 401k if you don't want to liquidate it? I've got to do more research on a 401k because I've never had one. I, I just, the last time I was at an actual employee was, um, you know, right around 2000. So it's almost 20 years ago. Um, but I, I think you'd have to look at what the underlying assets of that 401k are. So that's where I'd start. And, um, you know, if, if you've got, if you're hundred percent long, like, the, you know, S and P stocks, blue chips, and that's what is what, what the assets are in that 401k, then, you know, that 401k, uh, I, I wouldn't be too excited about that. So I think you have to start, first look at the underlying assets. What's the best way to protect a 401k if you don't want to liquidate it? Yeah, so I don't know if you can roll a 401k over into some sort of gold so you can get that insurance or uh, roll it into uh, cash flowing real estate. If you could roll it into cash flowing real estate, then I, I would look into that buying maybe a turnkey property in the Midwest where prices are are, are still reasonable if you can get good cash flow because real estate's a really good way to hedge against inflation. So if you're really concerned about the dollar collapse, uh, that that's a, a great place to be is, is cash flowing real estate because you are the, like Rick Rule says, you're, you're the price maker. You're not the price taker. And in inflation, that's who you want to be. And cash flowing rental properties allow you to do that. So, um, but I want to be clear that I need to do some more research on a 401k. We'll do a video on that so uh, I can give you a more educated answer. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, so here's another question from. We will world question. The financial system could be resilient. I think for 30 years like Japan question, it could. I mean, there's definitely more than a 0% probability. It, it definitely could. There, there's a less likelihood that it will just due to um, the fact that Japan is a huge creditor nation and that the United States is a massive debtor nation. So we are really held hostage to a certain extent by with, with foreigners buying our debt. You know, the, the Fed can't monetize it all without creating inflation where Japanese could monetize it a lot better. Not that they're not going to come to a reckoning because they absolutely will have to um, pay the fiddler at some point in time. But is it a possibility to do that for 30 years. Um, yes, but but I'd also remind people that, it, so a lot of people say, you know, that talk about the housing, that want to be a housing bull. Well, they say, well, you know, Japan's had uh, low interest rates so, for 30 years, so why can't we? Maybe we can just be, uh, you know, Japan. And yeah, but they forget that Japan, the housing market 
tanked in 1990 when they had their deflationary bust and they brought those interest rates down and it's never gone back up. Never. Neither has the market. So those people that are bullish on the market because they think that the United States can uh, hold down interest rates just like Japan or they're bullish on the housing market for that same reason. They need to be careful what they wish for because they're only looking at part of that Japanese picture. They're not looking at the whole thing. Okay. Glennis, I think we touched base on that. Thanks again for the super chat, Glennis. I'm just right there now. Okay. Do we be heading into hyperflation? Okay, so AD asks, could we be heading into hyperinflation? And if so, couldn't most assets go up in value, including real estate? Absolutely they can, but they can go up in nominal value. So, and they can also go up in real terms as well. But, but keep in mind, just because something goes up in nominal value doesn't mean that you're increasing your purchasing power. As an example, we'll, we'll use an extreme example of Venezuela. In Venezuela, the housing market there, denominated in their local currency, has gone to the moon. I mean, it's, 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 it's just skyrocketed. But you can't buy as much stuff with your house if you sold it now as you could have if you would have sold it 10 years ago. So it's, it's not about the price that's on the outside of your house. It's about how much stuff you can buy if you sell your house. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, Pat Patriot uh, Ike asks, what about the mining stocks? I think they're great. I, I think they're cheap. I don't consider them an investment because um, they don't really pay me to own them. But I think as a speculative play, which I think people should have a little bit allocated in their portfolio for that, I think that's a, that's a great way to go. And then Steve says Barrick pays a small dividend. So that's that's really cool. Thanks for that intel, Steve. Okay, so is that the username? Yes. It's not, okay. So stay curious. Uh, did a super chat for two dollars, and um, I really appreciate that. I don't think they included a question, but we appreciate the super chat. And uh, Baruch uh, asks again thoughts about nickel and copper mines long term. I'm not sure about the copper the copper mines. I, I haven't done much research on nickel, but I've been listening to a lot of stuff this past week on copper, not the mines, but but the the commodity itself. And if you're bullish on electric vehicles, which, you know, that looks like the direction that the governments are going to force us into, uh, you know, whether that's good or bad, that's another debate. But if that's the direction we're going, I think you got to be, you got to be bullish on copper, especially because right now it's historically very cheap. Now, Dr. Copper, as they call it, because it's a good signal for the economy. If it's super cheap, that's telling us that, that we should expect a recession. So, but I think over the long term, that if you want to take a speculative bet in something that doesn't pay to own it, if you've got maybe a five-year time horizon, uh, that's probably a good bet because it's cheap right now. Okay. Oh, mining got that, Barrick. Okay. Muzz. Well, I'm not sure what your username is, buddy. Sorry. Muzzard. Muzzard on my feet. Okay. Do you think it's possible that Trump is to keep the markets good until at least the election? Everything he's done, except trade war, leaving next president in a bad market, Trump looks better. He could. I mean, at the end of the day, no one has control over the market other than the market. I mean, Trump can do all he wants to try to pump it up with his rhetoric. But at the end of the day, the market's going to have the final say. I definitely think he's going to try to pump it up as much as he can before the election because for some reason the American public thinks that the market is the economy. They, they think they're synonymous when, when they're not even close. The market can go way, way up and the economy can, doing, can be doing very poorly just because there's so much liquidity that's being pumped into the market. But I definitely think that's going to be a strategy. Okay, uh, Ian, thank you very much for the super chat. He asks, on Real Vision, some say that Europe is worse than America because they have negative interest rates. 
they don't have our debt problems. So in your opinion, how bad is Europe? Are their problems too big? Europe's got some big problems. And I think their biggest problem is the negative interest rates because that has created so much distortions in their economy. Now, I can't say whether or not they're in worse shape than the United States. Um, that That's comparing two pretty dirty shirts <laughs> with, with that one. But I, I, I know that there's some things uh, in Europe that, that are getting cheap right now, but I would hesitate just because I think that there's just – there's just too much downside and, and why go into Europe when you could go into some other emerging markets where the CAPE ratio is the same, you can get a good dividend paying stock and you don't have to have all that downside with all the malinvestment and the negative interest rates. And um, sooner than later, guys, I'm going to start doing a lot of research for myself for buying stocks overseas and in, uh, in emerging markets and, and more developing markets. And I'll obviously share that information with, with all of you guys. Okay, Damon asked, what are my thoughts on, on crypto? As, philosophically, I love crypto. I mean, no one is more on board with, the, with uh, cryptocurrency than I am from a, a philosophical standpoint. I think it's great that we take control of our own currency and you take that out of the control of the governments and the central banks, especially Bitcoin, because you know it's, I think it's limited to 21 million Bitcoin. So in this ideal world, if the government were to go on to, uh, uh, or have to go on to a crypto that, um, that wasn't in their control, that would, and people don't realize that the whole reason we have war, not, not the entire reason, but that the main reason we have war is because of the Federal Reserve. If the U.S. couldn't print their own money to fight these wars through the Federal Reserve and they actually had to tax people, so people had to come out of pocket to fund the war, we would have far fewer wars in the entire world. So, I, I mean, talk about something that would be amazing is to, to not only limit the, the power and the control that the government has over all of our lives and, and half of, of every single transaction is money. So, and if they control the price of that money, that, that's a massive amount of control. And to take that out of their hands would be amazing. But I, I, as far as being a, a transaction currency, I don't know if Bitcoin has that in its current iteration. It may in the future, but I think that it's too cumbersome to, to be a, a method of, of you know, billions and billions of transactions on a daily basis. As a store of value, you know, if you want to call it digital gold, I think there may be an argument there, but I'd look at it more like a speculation, not an insurance policy, A, because it doesn't have the history that gold has, and B, because the price swings are, are just too volatile. Okay, so um, oh, Ohm uh, A, appreciate the super chat, my friend. He asks, or she asks, I want to own gold, not all physical. I know GLD is, is junk. <laughs> But what do you think about uh, the PHYS or the CEF, uh, which is equity rather than risky ETF? Thank you. I haven't done enough research there to give you a good opinion. I'm coming out with a video very soon that's going to take a deep dive into not only gold, but where I think the price is going and why, and then how you can you know, how you can play that as far as physical, um, you know, an, an ETF, maybe an ETF better with the miners. That might be a better way to go about that. But um, if it's an ETF that's that, that's a gold back ETF, I don't know if I see much value there. I'd really just hold the, the physical, especially because your carrying costs are, are pretty much the same. If, if it's an ETF that is backed by gold uh, miners, um, then I, I think that's a different story. But again, I don't think that's insurance. That's that's uh, speculative play. So I'm going to actually look that up as soon as we get done with this live stream. Because that, that's a great question. I need to know more about that. Okay. What are your thoughts on crypto? We got that. Okay, Eugene asks a real estate question. Why Columbia? You have mentioned Pittsburgh, Midwest quite a few times. Columbia seems a bit risky. Is it not 
even from a personal security. No, 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 no. Eugene, no, no, no. You, you've been no, you've been listening to the to the government's propaganda too much. And it's it's not your fault. I mean, it is what it is because in the United States we've, we're in an island basically. So uh, or the North America, you know, the continent. So we don't have any neighbor countries like Europe. They they don't have that phobia of the dragon over the the mountain light like we do in the United States. So from a security standpoint, no. Listen, the U.S. is far more dangerous <laughs> than than Colombia. Now, if you go out in the jungles where, where the drug guys are, then yeah, you're gonna have some problems. You, you don't want to. But that said, you wouldn't want to go into South Chicago at night either. So, as far as you know, the the areas that are you know the, the cities, or the nice areas, you know, there's no security issues. There, there might be a, a, an issue with some more petty theft. That's for sure. But but nothing uh, security wise, and the market is way safer. So why is the is the real estate market for, uh, much more safe? Because there's no credit in the system. Think about why we had the uh, the bursting of the the bubble in the housing market because no one could afford to pay their mortgage, right? Because those rates adjusted where they couldn't adjust, then everyone defaults, and then you have this this chain reaction. Well, in in Colombia, very few people have mortgages. The majority of the people own their property outright. So how can you have a, a big deflationary bubble uh, or a bubble bursting in the housing market if there's no credit in the system? No one has a mortgage. No one has to. The, the whole reason that you have a bubble exploding is because you have people that are forced to sell. If no one in the market is forced to sell, then you've got very little downside. So I see this as being far less risky in the United States for that for that main reason. And, and by the way, Eugene, if you're interested in uh, in Colombian real estate, you want to dive into a little bit more. I've got a Facebook group called Medellin Real Estate Investors. If you want to join that, you can see a lot of back and forth and, and get some more info on it. As far as why I like the stuff in Pittsburgh and West. Because it's not in this, it's 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 not as cheap as I like to buy it. But it, it, if you look at a price to income ratio, it's far more reasonable than anything else in the United States. And you can still buy things for under the cost of construction, which is what I love because that really hedges your downside. Okay, Marcus asks. Oh, we have another one here. Okay, nomadic RV living. Very, very cool, man. I'm all about it. Hopefully you got an Airstream like I do. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Oh, no question. Just thanks for the great videos as I'm starting to learn about the macro stuff and really enjoying it. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to go and watch the videos. Um, I, I think a lot of people have, have commented that they're enjoying the channel and it's just great to hear. I think there's so many... There's so much information out there as to what is happening in macro or um, you know in the United States economy, but there there very there's very little information on there out there on not only what is happening but why it's happening and how it's happening. So hopefully the channel kind of fills that that void where it, it's it's okay. I've got all this stuff here at this thirty thousand foot level. I know that what's going on, but I don't know why, because I really don't understand this. So hopefully we can bridge that gap. But thank you for the, the super chat. Okay, Marcus asks, if Duchess Bank failed, or maybe Deutsche Bank, maybe? I'm gonna guess you're meaning Deutsche Bank, Marcus. Failed, what would the ramification be on the rest of the banking system? Nobody knows that, because their derivatives book is bananas. So, and how much systemic risk they have to the entire system. It's just, nobody knows that because no one can value the derivatives book because it's so, it's so complex. So listen, the, 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 the smartest guys out there, like on real vision and macro voices, even they don't even have a clue as to how bad it could get if they go under. And, and to that point, I doubt they would, they'll probably get a bailout if it gets to that point.
Okay. So another asks, uh, should I buy a truck with Elon Musk? I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, Simon asks, when will the German banks bring down the financial, the world financial system? Again, a, a timing question is, is you just got to look at the probabilities. It, it, there's no way to, to specifically time these things. No way. Okay, John says, hunting for multifamily deals, best deals in the country now. Multifamily? I think it's going to be the same places where you're getting single family for those types of deals. It's, it's going to be South and, and the Midwest. Okay, Eric Edwards asks, uh, it says, great channel. Thanks for the super chat, Eric. Really appreciate it. California resident and first-time investor, 200,000K, Kansas City, emerging markets like Columbia. First and foremost, I, I go into uh, U.S. with 200,000 especially if all your bills are denominated in, in USD, Eric, which obviously I'm assuming they are because you live in the United States, the majority of that would have to go into Kansas City. You don't want to take too much currency risk coming down to Columbia uh, unless you've got, you know, unless you spend half your time there and half your time here. So your bills are denominated in both of the, the currencies. And I don't know that you could I don't know that you could allocate maybe just you know 10 or 20 percent to the Colombian market with that much to invest. So I would go in Kansas City. I'd take maybe some 50 percent LTV loans, so you've got some exposure to short the dollar because what you're doing with that 30-year fixed rate debt is you're basically shorting the dollar. And so I do that because I think that eventually that will make you a lot of money, a lot of purchasing power that's going to be transferred from the bank or from the lender to you because you're paying that back with cheaper dollars. And of course, I like any place like Kansas City. There's, other, there's a few other little pockets out there where you can get um, in good neighborhoods, good, you know, over a 1% RV ratio and under the cost of construction to express that bet, which is, which is the 30 year fixed rate debt. Um, as far as emerging markets like Columbia, um, if you had a little bit more to invest, I, I might say buy three properties in the States, maybe one in Columbia, but I'd start with Kansas City, get a feel for a market like that, get a feel for it, start to understand, you know, how to manage the property manager, because that's, that's a big part of it. And then once you get comfortable with it, then maybe, uh, you know, look to, to venture into a, a, a market outside the United States, but I might take some of that and at least set up a bank account outside the US so, so, and then maybe get some bonds, some Colombian bonds or something like that. So you're, you're diversifying that a little bit as far as your political risk and your currency risk. And then gold too, I'd, I'd have a little bit of gold in there. Okay. Uh, all right, so, okay, so we're at an hour guys. We've got a lot of people on here, 443 people, uh, 145 thumbs up. Guys. I really appreciate the support. It just, it, it's really, uh, it's really tough for me to get my head around that there's 441 people uh, on here live just going back and forth in the community. So really, really neat to see. So as long as we've got a lot of people in here, I'll, I'll keep going at least for another 15 minutes or so. So let's uh, get back to the questions. Oh, where was I? Why Columbia got that. Deutsche Bank got that. German Bank, okay, got that. Uh, Jared asks, question, hyperinflation, best indicator before this has happened, or before this happens. I, I would look at that video that I did that is, I think it's called dollar collapse. It's, it's that thumbnail wh where it's kind of got the dollar and it's kind of blowing away with the, the sand because I went into a deep dive on that study that the IMF did with uh, more recent hyperinflation inflations around the world. And I think if you watch that video and then go to that study, which if you look at the pinned comment on that video, I believe I've got, you know, how to Google or what keywords to Google to find that study. Go, it, it's a short study. Just go ahead and read it. Pretty easy to read. And then I think that'll give you a, a really good idea of kind of what's going on and what to look for. Question. Uh, so Farmer Dude asks, What's it take to get the dollar to drop? I mean, there's 
There's there's so many things. I mean, the, they they could, the, the the U.S. could artificially step in and and drop the currency. Um, I mean, investors could start to have less confidence in the U.S. where a lot of those dollars outside start to flood back in. There's just, um, I mean, the Fed MMT. I mean, I was researching MMT today for a video that I want to do this week on that, and it is bananas. It, it just wait till I come out with this video. It's it's what's interesting about it is on paper it actually works. It, it does. It, it works on paper, but in the real world, it it would just cause a complete just destruction and collapse of, of the economy because of the. The, the way that the resources would be allocated so inefficiently because you have more of the resources being allocated by the government. But um, again, just stay tuned for that video. But you know, if, if they pull off that MMT and go right around the system as it is right now, you can see actually right behind here, I'm, I'm, this is my, my notes and this is how I kind of think things through. But so what would happen, the way it works now is this is the bank right here. And they issue debt to the consumers. And that's how money gets into the system right now. So if people aren't borrowing, you can't get enough money into the system to create that velocity to get the inflation going. But see, what the, the, the Fed can do is they can just circumnavigate that process by starting to print MMT style going around so people wouldn't even have to take out debt to get that money into their account, increase velocity, and spend it. So this is really the catalyst. So how fast the Fed and the government will be willing to do this and just get around the system that we have for getting uh, currency out into the system right now, that, that's anyone's guess. But I, I think that if the pain gets bad enough, that that's what it will come down to. Okay, so he sent me that? Thing? Yeah. Okay. All right. So Baruch sent me a – I'm not sure what that is. It looks like some sort of pear that's giving me a <laughs> – <laughs> so thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate it. That's a funny icon. Okay, let me get to the next question here. Question. Well, drop okay, that's that. Uh, let's see, is it Lenny? Hopefully, I'm pronounced Lenny uh, Tesev asks if we do see high inflation coupled with a recession, uh, so 70s. And the S and P would go up instead of uh, or down. I'm assuming. Uh, wouldn't the uh, wouldn't financials struggle? Their loans would no yield nearly as much as they had projected. Yeah, but keep in mind, uh, most of the uh, the banks don't keep these loans on their books. They just as soon as that ink is dry, before the ink's dry, they've already bundled that and sold that off to you know the greater fool. So I, I don't know how much of that is, is still on the books of the major banks. So if it's Fannie and Freddie that's buying all that, depending on how much they're selling and how much is on their books, then it goes out, it, it really it falls in the lap of the taxpayer. It, it, because I'm assuming what you're asking me is if you've got the interest rate here, if, if inflation exceeds the interest rate, then that's a transfer of wealth from the, uh, the um the creditor to, or the lender to the borrower. So if, if, if you've got a fixed rate mortgage at 3%, let's, or 4%, let's just say, and inflation goes up to 10, whoever is holding that debt is going to lose a ton of, of not nominal money, but they're going to lose a ton of wealth, a ton of purchasing power. So who's holding that bag? I don't know, because as soon as they get the debt, they sell it and, and who knows where it goes from there and you know all these other investors they bundle it and whoever is holding the bag it, yeah they're they're going to feel some serious pain my guess is that's going to be the taxpayer okay if we see high inflation okay got it okay so ben says i'm interested in your take on rickard's master crypto token projection do you think that'll happen? I haven't heard him say much about it. I know his projections SDR will come in and, and take over once no one has any confidence in the dollar. But I haven't heard him talk about that. So I'm going to have to look into that. But to reiterate, 
I think that um, the the U.S. will be on a digital currency sometime within the next 10 years. It just gives them too much control over spending and, and where the dollars are going. And, and, you know, if we go into a crisis, I don't think the, uh, the Federal Reserve or the government is going to find religion all of a sudden and just say, oh, my gosh, Peter Schiff was right. All this stuff that we're doing is, is, is craziness, and we just need to let all this malinvestment flush itself out of the system. I think that they're just going to become, they're going to get, they're going to try to get more control. It's, it's not going to be less control. And the best way to do that is through a digital currency. Okay, got that. Three things. Okay. Okay, question. Okay, Robert asks. The U.S. owes a debt, but who do we owe the debt to? A lot of different people. You know, so, so many of the people say, like Krugman always says, oh, we owe it to ourselves. It's no big deal. It's, that's weak thing. That's like third grade thinking. We do have a lot of it that's owed to ourselves, but there's a lot that's out there that is held by foreign investors and uh, individuals, countries, corporations. So we owe it to a lot of people. If you go and uh, just Google that, you can pull up how much of like a pie chart of how much of our debt, the 22 trillion or whatever it is now, probably 23 by now, is, is you know, who, who actually owns that. And you've got to also remember that the, and this is research that I did this weekend for another video, is that the, uh, I think I'll actually put this in the shift video tomorrow. So the, 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 the U.S. debt, the average length to maturity on the U.S. debt, the 22 trillion that we have right now, is around five years. So people forget that the, the U.S., they, they've got to roll that debt over. And so, my goodness, can you imagine if the U.S. had to roll that debt over at 5% interest rate? Oh, my goodness. They would just get, that That would be, I don't know how they, they'd work their way out of that one. But uh, we'll talk about it more in the video tomorrow. Let's see, do Michael Smith asked, do you think places like Arizona growing population will weather the downturn? Well, housing is crazy. 4% growth last year. I would go on and look at the income to the price to income ratio. And that's how I always, that's how I measure if real estate is, is way out of whack. I, I know I've got that formula in there in that one video. That's kind of just a, obviously that's not a real specific formula, but that's just kind of the, the, the first um, way to start thinking about if a market is uh, expensive or not. I think it's in that video called rent to rent or buy. But I would start by looking at the uh, price to income ratios. If you can pull up a chart of the prices in Arizona, you know, adjusted for inflation going back as far as you can, that would be great. And then I'd look at cash flows. I'd look at the RV ratios there and what you can get. And if you're getting less than a 1% RV ratio, to me, that's too expensive. Um, I, I would like to put that equity in play elsewhere. Okay, so uh, Ian asked, Ian, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate it, buddy. Where to learn to invest like an Austrian? <laughs> well, keep in mind, I, I don't, I, I, if I'm gonna side with one school of thought, it's definitely gonna be the Austrian school, but there are some things that, that I, I don't agree with fully with the Austrian school. I, I always tell people that I just try to use the school of common sense and it's not really, you know, Keynesian or Austrian or although I, I don't like much of the Keynesian guys, but um, you know, the, 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 the Chicago school or anything like that. I just try to use common sense. That, that, that's, that's all I use. And it just seems as though uh, the common sense usually falls on the side of the Austrians. but where would I go to learn? I would listen to, uh, I'd listen to, um, uh, Bob Murphy and Tom Woods podcast Contra Krugman because they're both Austrians, really good Austrians. And so they re refute a lot of Krugman's nonsense in his New York times column. And so you can kind of pick up a lot there, but if you look at a lot of the guys uh, that are really, really smart investors and, and it, they might not come out and admit it, but they're going to, they're going to side with the Austrian school. So I would look at the type of investments like Shift does and Jim Rogers as well. 
I would look at, try to read some of his books and start to understand his methodology. And uh, because if you, uh, Schiff will come out and say that he's Austrian. I don't think Rogers would come out and say that he's, you know, a hardcore Austrian guy. I think he'd be like me where he just says, well, I just use common sense. But if you, if you listen to what, how he looks at economies and how he looks at macro, it's definitely from a, uh, an Austrian view, Mark Faber as well. So I, I look at how guys uh, allocate their own capital and how they uh, guys like Schiff, Mark Faber, and Jim Rogers, and that's kind of where I'd start. And then um, macro voices, a, a lot of those guys are, are going to be, again, they probably wouldn't call themselves that, but they're going to lean that way. And then a lot of the guys on Real Vision as well. So to summarize, Real Vision, macro voices, uh, read some of Jim Rogers' books, look at what Schiff is talking about, and um, and Mark Faber. Okay, what do you think about? Oh shoot, I just lost my place. I went. I think I went all the way down. <laughs> all right, guys, bear with me one moment here. Um, oh, I lost my place. Okay, I might, oh boy, I might, in fact, I'm sure I'm skipping over some questions. Guys, I apologize. I, I accidentally hit the wrong button here. Um, let me go to this because this is a really good question right here. Uh, AG asks, how would you respond to brokers in real estate when they say the trend is your, <laughs> the trend is your friend? So this market is still on an uptrend and the risk is that I may be bought out of the market. What do you think? Or basically what they're saying is you'll lose out on all these returns. Number one, I would, I would say if you hit on it, if you're playing blackjack and you hit on a 19, you definitely could get a two. And so if, if you're sitting next to a guy that's playing blackjack, and he decides to hit on a 19 and you say, and you say, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That's a bad mood. That's a bad probability. He says, Oh, forget it. I don't care. And he hits on a, uh, a 19 and let's say he gets a two and he gets blackjack and he turns around and looks at you and says, Oh, I told you, I told you if I would have, if I would have stayed on that 19, then I wouldn't have got blackjack. I, I would have missed out on all those gains and all those returns. Well, yeah, you could say that, but you're going against the probabilities. And if you continue to make that bet, you're going to go bust. That's what I'd say to them, number one. So you're betting against the house. You're betting against the probabilities. Number two, I would just show them a long-term chart of U.S. housing going back to 1890. I show it in almost every housing video. But if you adjust for inflation, look at the discrepancy between the trend line and where we are now. I mean, how can you say that, that that's sustainable. No one in their right mind can look at that one chart and say that it's sustainable in real terms, in nominal terms, sure. But but that doesn't, we don't care about that because that, that's not applicable to purchasing power. Uh, and then number three, I'd say, I'd tell them to look at a chart of Japan. All these people say, you know, I, I hear them online all the time. They'll say, yeah, but the housing market always recovers. And if you hold on to it long term for 20 or 30 years, then you don't care if the market goes down by 50% because it's always going to, recover really well look at japan japan it, it, not only that but japan has dropped it, they've had uh, zero interest rates and negative interest rates for 30 years for heaven's sakes 30 years almost and they've done massive amounts of quantitative easing where is the housing market today 30 years later compared to where it was in 1990 1990 here today here it's it's never it's never gotten back up to where it was. So this this is a massive fallacy that we have that, that most Americans have that the uh, the housing markets just always recover. That is not true at all. So that's how I respond to them. And then I'd show them one of my videos. <laughs> that's how I respond to them. I say, look at this video. How, how do you? You know, where are you going to go from there? Okay. Um, Rich says, what are your thoughts on holding dividend stocks? 
I like dividend stocks better than 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 the stocks that don't even pay pay you to own them. It's just, I mean, you're taking so much tail risk there with the market, Rich. I mean, even if you're getting a, a 5% dividend yield, I mean, you got 50% downside in the market. So I don't know. If, if I was going to do dividend stocks in the U.S., if I had to do it, I would just make sure that I got short positions in non-dividend paying stocks um, and, and some you know companies that are, are riskier, like uh, some that I've mentioned in the past. Everyone, you know, you either hate Tesla or you love it. Uh, again, I, I think the cars are fantastic. I think the stock is just way overpriced. And so, you know, maybe you short something like that and have a good dividend paying stock. And you, know, you do that maybe 10 times. So you got to have a, a diversified portfolio there. And um, that, that's maybe I do something like that. OK, um, but but I'd also if you if you've got the, the time to do the research, I'd look at dividend paying stocks overseas as well. So you can get some diversification there. OK, Google user asks, if you were 40 years old, had a lot of student loan debt, oh my gosh, around 450K, wow, and could work anywhere in the world, no kids, would you stay in the U.S.? No way. I have about 150K saved. No way would I stay in the U.S. First of all, I, I would, I don't know if you've done this already, I would term that student loan, you know, what they call it, ref I forgot what they call it, not refinance, but I, I would I would get that student loan payment down to, or uh, debt down to where my payments were as little as possible. Why? Because if Democrat gets in the White House, you got a good chance of them coming in and just wiping that slate clean. So I would make as the, the absolute bare minimum pay payment to that that I possibly could. And, and it's just, you know, why pay it off when you got such low interest rates? I, I don't see any reason to pay off any of that principle. But um, you can work anywhere in the world. There is no way I would stay in the United States. Not a chance. This is the easiest question of the night. Go to a country like Colombia where you can, listen, it, especially if you're making your monies in, dollar, in dollars. I'm assuming you, you do things online so you can make money in dollars. So if you can make money in dollars and have your bills in a currency like the Colombian peso, you can expand your, your, your standard of living to a point that is beyond what you can even imagine. If you had even like two or three grand U.S. coming in, if you've got that coming in in Colombia, I mean, you're going to be living. That would be the equivalent of having maybe 10 or 15,000 coming in in the United States. And it's not just Colombia. There's a lot of countries I've been to that are like that. I've been to almost, uh, well, probably 40, 40 plus countries. Croatia is another one. Montenegro is another one. These are beautiful places, amazing places. And you can just take all that money that you would have spent in the United States, put it to savings, put it to investing in real estate properties or, or, or you know something that's paying you to own it so the assets that you have are paying off your student loan debt. And then just wait for Bernie to get in there and wipe the slate clean. <laughs> uh, all right. Good question, though. Great question. Uh, let's see. Winfred says, please get up to speed on Bitcoin. I'm, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. But G GDC says, are you proposing to leave the country in default? Well, that's not what I'm proposing. Default on the loan. I'm, I'm not proposing that. Maybe he's talking about the person who asked the original question. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha, Ford or Ferrari. Hey, I'm a car guy, man. I, uh, yeah, I've had so many of my friends tell me, you got to see the movie. You know, I love Rush. If you guys saw that, that Formula One movie, it's based on the story of, uh, oh, who was it? It was uh, 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 James Hunt and, uh, and Nicky Lauda. And, oh, it was so good. So I'm, I've, I've seen a couple documentaries on this, so I'm really looking forward to seeing the movie. Uh, 
if I got to choose between a Ford GT and a, and a Ferrari, like a, oh boy, that's tough. I, I've had, I've owned Ferraris before. I've never owned a Ford GT. I wanted to buy a Ford GT. I was this close to doing it back a while ago and I didn't do it. I've had uh, the, the, the 308 uh, convertible. I had that way back in the day. That was a great car, but that's a tough choice. Okay. Um, that's true though. Uh, Peter Schiff is right just a second. No public debt be canceled. All right, so Ted asks, when will public debt be canceled uh, at the control account level? Uh, you know, holding non productive fully accountable. When will the debt be canceled? I'm assuming you're talking about a debt jubilee. Ted, if you're not, I apologize. That's, that's just what I'm gathering from your question. It, that would be tough because if you're going to do a debt jubilee, boy, that, that's, that's really going to – the release valve on that would most likely be the currency. And that could get really, really ugly. So I, I don't see them doing a debt jubilee. I just see them devaluing the, the, the debt through inflation. Okay. <laughs> Krugman is a psychopath. <laughs> uh, I, I don't. I don't know if I'd use that strong a word, but he's definitely nuts. The, the guy's nuts. Okay, I'm trying to find another question here, guys. If you have a question, uh, just make sure you you highlight that, please, by saying question. Uh, I don't see. Oh, you know what, Kyler, right here. I'm gonna do some research on this as well. He says Bridgewater bought uh, 1.5 billion worth of puts. I, I I've heard that so often, but then I I saw Dalio go on Twitter and tweet that that was fake news. So I I need to do some more research to really see what's going on there. But but that that could be a great video. So I'm gonna try to get to that this week. Great point. Okay, so Sleepy Fish, do you think banks can buy up homes in case of crash or not let them crash? I don't know if they can buy, they buy up the homes. I just think that they buy up the mortgages and keep them on their balance sheet. So even if the people default, they're defaulting to the Fed and the Fed has no reason to sell them because they can just print more money to, to cover the loss. So <clears throat> I don't think they'd buy the home. I just think they'd buy the debt so the person, so they'd never have to foreclose on them. And I think that might be happening right now, to be honest with you. And the reason I say that is because they're buying a lot of uh, mortgage-backed securities in the repo market. And and remember, they've got a lot of, uh, of MBSs on their, their balance sheet that they bought over the past however many years. So, you know, why did they buy those, those, that, all that, uh, all that paper? I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say because that paper is bad. And they don't want to foreclose on the people because they don't want the housing market to go down. Because remember, they're 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 just phobic of of any type of price drop. So, okay, lots of people. What do you think of the average? Oh, Peter asked, "What do I think of the average age of the viewers?" It's right around my age. I, I looked at uh, YouTube gives you stats on that, and it's uh, you know between forty and and fifty five. I'm 46. Kurt asks, am I a bear on the market? Yeah, because it's expensive. So I don't, I'm bearish on anything that's not cheap. Or, or purchase with something that's cheap, like 30 year fixed rate debt. Okay, any more questions here? Okay, here's a question. Question, when will the bank, I just lost it. When will the bank crack? Shoot, now they're moving on me. Uh, when will the bank crash come? And will it be uh, the beginning of starvation? Starvation throughout the West. Not, I'm, I'm not sure I'd go that far. Um, when will, again, I can't answer any when questions. It's just, it's unknowable, totally unknowable. You, I just, you can just say that you can just measure probabilities and as interest rates get lower, especially with the inverted yield curve, 
uh, in, and potentially negative rates, that's going to put a lot more pressure on the banks. Okay, Ben says, meet Kevin has a great uh, video. Yeah, you know, that, that kid is really, really smart. I don't agree with everything he says, especially on the real estate market. But both meet Kevin and, um, and, uh, and Graham Stephan. Smart kids, man, really smart kids. I, I, I don't think they, again, I disagree with them on a lot of their macro views. because I, I think that if they did the homework and actually took it, uh, their macro analysis uh, to, to, you know, a few layers down, they'd come to different conclusions. But, man, really smart kids. Okay, hour and a half. All right, guys, a couple more questions here, and I, I, I got to go. Um, question, do you have... Uh, oh, Penny says, question, do you have college degrees? Uh, I, I have a college degree in uh, public relate and communications, but uh, zero, uh, you know, finance or uh, uh, econ classes. I almost flunked out of high school. I was this close to flunking out of high school. Um, but I, I actually got into college with an athletic scholarship. So um, didn't do that great in college, but I was never a really good student. That wasn't my thing. Okay, your question, George, what do you think of weed stocks? I don't know anything about them. Uh, I, I just, so many people know about them. I, I like to buy things when, when they're, people don't like them. And so I, I don't know if I'd go into that right now. Okay, so uh, we'll do, uh, here's a question. I was moving fast on me here. I question, what is your opinion on Fundrise for, is that like crowdfunding? I, I don't, I'm not familiar with, uh, shoot, the question moved. I'm not familiar with Fundrise, MH, I apologize. Um, if it's, if it's, I don't know if it's hard money or if it's crowdfunding. Uh, I, I don't know anything about it, so I don't have a good opinion on that. But if you're real estate investing, I think hard money is, is a great way to go. Okay, guys. Um, I got to get going because I got to eat dinner. It's been great, guys. Um, I, I, actually, with this one, I'll probably leave this public. So if you guys want to go back and watch it again, you can do that. And um, if you guys like this type of live content, want to see me do this every Sunday or at least most Sundays, go ahead and let me know in the comment section, and I'll, I'll read that live chat when I get done. Other than that, guys, uh, thanks for being a part of it. Really, really, really appreciate all the super chats and all the support there, guys. And uh, we'll see you on tomorrow's video. It's gonna be an awesome one on Peter Schiff's book on the coming bankruptcy of the United States. So uh, check that out tomorrow. See you guys later.